What's up, y'all? PDT here. Coming on a little bit early because, like I tell you every week, if I come on late, you think that I'm not coming. Uh, Lord, spam in my mailbox. Okay, I'm trying to let everybody know that I'm. Okay. Okay, this is my last weekly live prophetic word for the year, but I'm going to say that many times during the during the broadcast. So if you're just watching the replay, uh, you know, you're hearing me saying at the top of the hour, but I'm going to say it many times. So this is my last prophetic uh, live broadcast for the year. Now, what I do uh, at the end of every year, I can't believe we're at the end of this year, but this is one I'm sure we're not sad to see go because, oh, wow, but we don't want to speak too soon because we don't know what 2021 holds. Ugh. So the only thing we got to know now is you got to hold fast. You got to make your calling and election sure. If you haven't learned anything from this year, you should have learned that now's the time to, to get right and stay right with God. You should have learned that now's the time to hear the voice of the Lord your God. Now's the time to be sure that you have the relationship with him that he wants, not the relationship that you want. I'll explain that in a minute. So anyway, so at the end of each year, I give a live, uh, well, no, it's not live. I give a prophetic word, a locator word, at the end of every year and at the beginning of each new year, the prophetic locator word at the end of each year is so that we can get our grades. So we can ask God, did we do what you want us to do this year? A lot of people miss that from Revelation 2 and 3. Now, if you're coming on early in the broadcast now, I'm going to say this. And when you're watch, watching the replay, I'm going to say these things several times during the hour because I want everybody to hear them. But a lot of people don't understand the point of Revelation 2 and 3. The point of Revelation 2 and 3 was not just the Lord <clears throat> giving grades to the church in Asia, churches in Asia. Okay, make sure my phone stays charged. It was not just the Lord giving grades to the churches in Asia. It was showing us also as New Testament believers that that is a part of the Lord's function now in glory, that he gives grades to his body. He lets us know what he's pleased with, what he's not pleased with. He lets us know if we're living the way he wants us to live or if we're not. Okay, so that is part of what Jesus is doing in heaven now. That's part of his high priestly work. So he's not just mediating for us. Uh, for the new covenant before father he is but he is also speaking to the church that's why he said seven times he that hath and hear let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church okay not just the churches in asia but the church the believers so what that means is that you don't need to be living year by year really day by day it really should be day by day but you know, you don't need to be living season by season in your life and not be sure you have a regular time that you check in with the Lord and ask the Lord, am I living the way you want me to live? Am I doing what you want me to do? Because if not, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your life. And then you're going to end up like one of those Christians that ends up standing before the Lord, thinking that you did all these religious things in his name. And then he gives you the depart from me you that work in iniquity, I never knew you, because what you follow was your agenda. What you follow was your plan. What you let me take my wait, let me close off. What you followed was serving God based on what you thought, instead of slowing down, taking the time, and asking God, "Do we have the relationship that you want?" And so that takes me back to what I said before. That is what twenty twenty. Why is his battery decreasing? That is what 2020 
has been about on one dimension on the spiritual tip. And I know that a lot of people just don't get that. I know a lot of people may have missed that. So that's why I'm saying it. That, you know, what you're supposed to have been doing, doing this year, what you're supposed to have gotten out of this year, because I know so much of what we did was just literally to survive. But what you're supposed to have gotten out of this year, what you should have been doing is <clears throat> slowing down because you didn't have any choice because God shut the world down <laughs> to make your calling and election sure, to make sure that what you were doing and how you were living was what the Lord wanted. Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to have to have to check the power source for this. Hold on just one second. Hold on just one second because his battery is decreasing and that is not acceptable. I don't understand why. It sounds like... So we're going to try it here. All right, so we're going to have to go with that and hope that holds. So, yeah, so that's what we should have been doing in 2020. That was part of the point of everything that's been going on. If you didn't get the point of what's been happening. Uh, check in my group. Let me show my group. Got so. Uh, so, again. So starting over again, this is. The last live, no, I'm not showing up on my page. I'm just checking all my stuff. This is the last live weekly prophetic word for the year. So just giving people a chance to come on. Just giving people a chance to come on. Yes, there we go. Great. So I am live. Coming through. Excellent. So I know the screen might keep freezing. Yeah, it looks like the screen is kind of starting to freezing, but we'll just have to push on through that. Okay, just have to push on through that, okay. All right, well, it's 2.30. I want to give people a, a little bit more time to come on, but... We need to go ahead on and get started. Okay. All right. All right. So again, this is my last weekly live prophetic word for the year. So we're going to say a word of prayer and we're going to jump on in. So thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for another opportunity. Oh, Holy Father and oh, Holy Savior to be used of you to uh, deliver your prophetic word. Thank you, precious Holy Ghost, uh, for giving us the prophetic, for being sure that we can hear your voice, oh God, that we still know what's going on with you. So I ask you to fill me with the Holy Ghost, oh God, forgive me for any sin. I decrease so you can increase. I die to myself. I lay down, oh God, so you can speak through me. So speak through me right now, oh God, and use me and breathe through my mouth and let uh, what is said be what you want said. So it can have the impact that you want it to have because you said your word is not going to return to you void. And you told us just say what you told us to say. So I'm going to be obedient and do that. And we're looking for great things and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow all those that receive and obey this word. In Jesus' name we pray and declare and decree it. Amen. 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 All right. All right. Yeah, that still a little bit behind, but that's okay. Okay. All right. All right. We do have 
a prophetic word from the day. And the prophetic word for today is virtue. Put that on the screen. The prophetic word for today is virtue. Uh, and then we're gonna look at something very specific in the scripture so you can understand what that's talking about and how to apply it. Because remember, you, whenever we're looking at the scripture, whenever we're doing a prophetic word or prophetic teaching or anything that has a Bible anchor, we want to not just read it, but we want to ask the author of the Bible, the Holy Ghost, that's why I pray before I prophesy, to tell us what he wants to get out of it. How do we apply it to our lives now? Okay. All right. The foundation scripture is going to be Ruth. Ruth chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. If you don't know the story of Ruth, it's fascinating and it's definitely worth reading. If you've never read the book of Ruth, then it's definitely something you should go through because it's an incredible story. It's an absolutely incredible story and there's so much in it. It's rich with principles and um, so many principles that I think sometimes people skip over the richness of the book. Well, we're going to focus today on, let me put that in the chat. We're going to focus today on Ruth chapter 3, 10 and 11. Because our prophetic word for today is virtue. Now I am reading out of the King James Version, but I'll read out of a couple other versions. Okay. And he said, now the he there is Boaz. And Boaz is the main male character of the story. And you have to read the whole story, but long story short, Ruth is the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Ruth, Naomi is a woman that's a Jew. She's a Hebrew and she lived in Bethlehem, but her and her husband left uh, because there was a famine. So they left to, to go to Moab, which is where Ruth was from. And so the sons got married there. But while they were out there, their father died. <coughs> And then uh, Naomi's husband, I mean, Naomi, Naomi's husband, and then she was left with her two sons. And then 10 years later, they died. So the sons had gotten married. And then after the sons died, 10 years after Naomi's husband died, then Naomi was like, I need to go back home. I need to go back to Bethlehem. There's nothing out here for me. And so both of her daughters-in-law said, we'll go with you. Naomi said to them, well, I'm old and I'm not going to get another husband. And even if I could have any more children, would you wait until they were grown up? Would you stay single for them? So she's like, no, my daughters, no, don't, you know, don't attach your wagon to me. So Naomi was basically saying, I'm pretty much done. <clears throat> when she got back home, she said, I left out full. I had a husband and two sons and now I've come back empty. And she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. So when she was telling her daughters-in-law that basically she was done, there was one named Orpah. And by the way, that's who Oprah is named after. And Oprah's mother was trying to name her Orpah, but just kind of switched the P and the R. And that's, you know, the history of Oprah's name. But the one named Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and said bye. In other words, Naomi urged her to go back to her people. And Orpah eventually said, OK. So they hugged and they kissed and Orpah went back home. Then Naomi turned to Ruth and said the same thing, like, you should go home too. And Ruth is like, I'm not leaving you. I don't care what you say. Your God is going to be my God. Your people is going to be my people. Where you die, there will I also be buried. And may the Lord judge me severely if nothing, if anything but death parts me and you. That's how deep Ruth was. That's how intense she was with it. If you wondered why that was Ruth's response, because Ruth knew somewhere inside of her that her destiny was with Naomi. That's why she was vehement, so vehement about not letting Naomi get away. So that's just a synopsis. So while they're there, Ruth is working. Naomi said, I want to find your husband. I want to secure your future. <clears throat> and so Ruth started working in the, a relative on the side of Naomi's late husband. And in Hebrew culture, that means that he had an obligation if Ruth was single, or if there was any single women to basically, you know, continue to raise up seed to keep the bloodline alive. And that was called a kinsman redeemer, meaning that he was obligated to pay Naomi's debts, buy back her property, make sure that Naomi and Ruth were financially secure, as well as, as, well as uh, taking Ruth as his wife. So that's the scenario. 
So before all that happened, Naomi was like, well, we need to find your husband. And then she was basically coaching Ruth through what to do to make sure that she got Boaz's attention and to make sure that uh, that Ruth got the husband that God wanted her to have. So Naomi was co coaching Ruth through all that to tell her how to get Boaz's attention, how to become his wife, okay? And what ended up happening is Ruth got in the bloodline of King David. She became King David's great grandmother, but she also got in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. She got in the very line of Christ himself. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but that's the basic story, okay? So Ruth had gone to the threshing room floor after Boaz had worked all day. Boaz went to sleep in a pile of corn and then Ruth snuck in while he was asleep, uncovered his feet and laid down at his feet. So at midnight, at the middle of the night, you know how sometimes, you know, if somebody was in your room, you could sense it. So at midnight, Boaz kind of kind of jumped awake. He got startled awake. And then, you know, he looked down and he said, oh, Lord, <clears throat> a woman was laying at his feet. And he was like, who are you? And Ruth said, I'm your handmaid. Spread your skirt, therefore, over me, for I'm a near kinsman. In other words, redeem me, because you know uh, you have the obligation, and this is the way Hebrew culture works. Remember that Ruth was a Moabitess, so that was not her way. Naomi taught her that. Okay, but remember, Ruth had already committed to following Naomi's people, Naomi's standards, whatever it took, because Ruth knew that this was her family now. Okay, so we're going to key in on verse ten. This is what Boaz said in response to Ruth. Once he woke up at midnight, found her asleep at his feet in the corn heap after a long day's worth work on the threshing room floor. This is what Boaz said to her. So I'll give you the background. <clears throat> Boaz said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, and as much as thou followest, followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Whew. Okay, first thing I wanna tell you is, literally every word in that sentence is important. Every single word in that sentence is important. And we, we have to look at it as such because there's so much going on there. So first thing Boaz did was he blessed her. He said, blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. What is Boaz talking about? Okay, because then he goes on to say, uh, well, anyway, what is Boaz talking about when he says you have shown more kindness now than before? What he's talking about is, is that when Ruth first came into town with Naomi, Ruth did everything she could to support Naomi. Ruth went to work herself and Ruth worked all day. She worked from sunup to sundown with a short lunch break in the middle. And so she garnered a reputation because Boaz had already met her on the field and they had already told her about, they'd already told him about her work ethic. So uh, uh, Ruth had kind of made it known that even though she was the Moabite daughter of Naomi, that she wasn't daughter-in-law of Naomi, she wasn't even a Hebrew, that she was gonna do everything she could to make sure her mother-in-law was taken care of. So Ruth was working from sunup to sundown with a short lunch break in between. So when he says, thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end, let's look at that word, kindness. That word kindness in the Hebrew, or the phrase more kindness, means kindness, piety, reproof, beauty. Uh, by, implica by implication, piety, it really is translated repro reproof or beauty. So basically what it means, if you don't know what piety means, it means humility. It means godly reverence. It means a holy lifestyle and a holy behavior and holy spirit inside of you. So Boaz was telling Ruth that <clears throat> you're showing more kindness more humility, a more of a holy lifestyle now than you did because we know about all that stuff you did taking care of Naomi when you first came into town, making sure that your mother-in-law was taken care of. 
But then he goes, he says this, <clears throat> because you have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. Oh, uh, what did Boaz just say? Boaz just said <laughs> that most of the other women in the city, uh, and I'm assuming in Ruth's age range, are still young enough to get married and have children. Or, or maybe, you know, in their 30s, which you can still, women obviously can still have babies in their 30s. But he was basically saying that a lot of them women were being cougars. <laughs> a lot of them women was being promiscuous. A lot of them women were sleeping around. A lot of them women, he basically said they wanted them college age boys because Boaz was older. So that means just about every woman he knew or every woman of note was busy running after a young man. Boaz told Ruth that she showed more humility and a holy lifestyle by not being promiscuous, by not running after those young men, by not following after that trend like all the other women were doing. So in other words, it was Ruth's godly lifestyle, not just in taking care of Naomi, but also in not being promiscuous, not sleeping around, even though that was clearly the order of the day because Boaz said, you've shown more humility and more holiness because you're not running after the young men, whether rich or poor, implying that all the other women were. And then he said, whether rich or poor. So in other words, some of them was doing it because they was trying to get, you know, secure that those finances. Some of them were doing it because they just wanted to hook up with that or whatever. But Boaz told Ruth, you're a standout because you're not doing none of that. Okay. Then he said <clears throat> in verse 11, and now my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now there it is again. Boaz again, he comforts her. He says, don't be afraid. He said, I'll do for you whatever you request. Since all my fellow townspeople know, Berean Study Bible, that you are a woman of noble character. New Living Translation. Uh, now, don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. English Standard Version of Ruth 3.11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. New American Standard Bible. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. King James Bible, and now my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Wow, those verses are action packed, action packed. So Boaz told Ruth not to worry. And the reason he told her not to worry is because he was going to do his job as the kinsman redeemer. He was going to redeem her. He was going to make sure that all the property that was due to Naomi and Ruth got to them. And he was going to marry Ruth. And, and he said that he's going to do all that because all the people of my town. Stop right there. What did Boaz just say? Boaz just said that your reputation has preceded you that the way you have carried yourself, because I'm gonna say it again, Ruth was a Moabitess. She was not a Hebrew woman. She was not Jewish. Boaz, Boaz, Boaz is saying to her that your reputation has proceeded you, that everybody in town knows about you. What do they know about you, Ruth? That you are a woman of noble character, that you are a virtuous woman, that you are a worthy woman, that you are a woman of excellence. Are all the different translations in English? Let's look at that word, uh, that phrase in Hebrew. The phrase of noble character is the Hebrew word chayil, chayil. And what it means is uh, army, wealth, virtue, valor, or strength. Okay, now that word chayil in Ruth 3.11 is the same word in Proverbs 31.10. Proverbs 31.10, you know, the, the virtuous woman chapter that we like to quote all the time. Well, Proverbs 31.10 says, a wife of noble character who can find, or a, an excellent wife 
who can find or a virtuous wife who can find for her price is far above rubies. That word there, noble character, that phrase is the same word in Hebrew, kayil, okay? Valor, strength. Uh, it also refers to an army. It also means wealth and it means virtue. You see that? So what Boaz says to Ruth is that I'm going to do everything that you request, everything that you want me to do, since everybody knows you are a worthy woman, you are an excellent woman, you are a virtuous woman, you are a woman of valor. Now, what the Holy Spirit wanted me to release today was to let everybody know that God's love is unconditional, but many of his blessings are conditional. You do not have to qualify for God's love, but you do have to qualify and be in position for certain kinds of blessings. So in other words, what, what we have made a mistake when I say we, I mean spiritual leaders and, and some ministers have made a mistake by telling people things like, well, what God has for me is for me. That's not incorrect, but that is incomplete. The, the idea can be conveyed there, it can be misconstrued, that it doesn't matter how I live and that it doesn't matter what I do, that God is just gonna bless me anyway. And that is genie concept. And that is why I started my No More Genies program on Thursday night, because that conveys the wrong idea and that's why people have been running around with that wrong idea for so long that I can just live any kind of way I want to and just do whatever I want because what God has for me is for me and it's just going to happen. No, 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 no. His love is unconditional. You don't have to do anything for God to love you. He already loves you because he is love. But his blessings, and some very specific blessings, are conditional. You have to listen to what he's telling you and do what he's telling you to do. And you have to be in a position, in a position, in a position to inherit that particular blessing. And so what Boaz is trying to emphasize here and what the message is here is that it was because of Ruth's reputation and the way she carried herself. Because she was not living a promiscuous life because she was working hard day and night to be sure that Naomi was provided for. She didn't just come back in town with her mother-in-law and then abandon her because she was not going after the young boys, whether rich or poor. She showed strength of character. She showed virtue. And it was that very strength of character that got her on the radar for the blessing of God. Why is that important? And then I'm gonna talk about the power of that women have where God put a woman's power. But why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important. Don't miss this, because this is not a small thing. What I'm about to say now is not a small thing. Don't miss it. That means that in the town of Bethlehem during the time of Ruth, there is not one woman with enough virtue to get on God's radar or Boaz's radar. And what God was handing out was a place in the bloodline of Christ, a place in the bloodline of King David. And then by extension, that meant a place in the bloodline of Christ. Do you understand that? A chance to be part of the royal bloodline, both for the greatest mortal king of Israel, King David, and the greatest king period, the king, the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ruth had a chance that she shouldn't have even had because she wasn't Hebrew. But that means all them women in the city at that time, not one of them, not one of them had enough virtue, had enough valor, had enough strength of character to get on God's radar and to get on Boaz's radar. But what I'm trying to get you to see is not only was that the conditions, but they didn't even know what they were missing out on. Why do you think Boaz said, you're not running after the young men? They was chasing after other stuff and God was trying to do something. So in other words, God was offering a place in history. God was offering destiny. Full time. 
God was offering a major place in history. He was offering a chance to marry into the royal family. And, and, and he was offering a place in history. And not near one of them women had enough virtue or valor or strength of character to get on God's radar and get on Boaz's radar. So God had to reach over here to a woman that wasn't even a Hebrew, that was coming back in town with her Hebrew mother-in-law and give it to her. So what's the lesson there? The lesson there is there are many times in life when we are out being fast, being promiscuous, being disobedient, being rebellious, sowing our oats. I'm young, so I need to have my fun now. All the, the things we say, and we don't understand that there is destiny sometimes on the line, and we have missed out on it because we were not where we should have been with God. That's why I started off the broadcast saying this is my last prophetic broadcast for this year. But at the end of each year, in the beginning of the new year, I give a locator word so we get our grades for the year from the Lord. Because we're supposed to ask the Lord at the beginning, at the end of it, at least it should be every day. And it should, you know, you know, every month, every quarter, you should be asking the Lord, am I doing what you want me to do? That actually should be daily. Give us this day our daily bread. But at least. We can release a prophetic locator word annually from the Holy Spirit. So what the Lord is doing in Revelation 2 and 3 is giving grades to the churches. You're supposed to get your grades from Jesus. That's what that's about, if you didn't know that. And so that being the case, that means that God was handing out destiny and all the mother women missed it. They missed it because they was off busy doing something else instead of being the kind of woman that God required to put into King David and by extension, the Lord Jesus Christ bloodline. So don't ever let anybody tell you that the unconditional love of God is the only qualifier you need for every blessing that God has for you. That's not the truth. You have to be in a position. That is why God loved Abraham and God loved Lot. But God made his covenant with Abraham. Why? Because Lot loved carnality. Because Lot loved Sodom and Gomorrah. Because Lot loved the world. And God was not going to make a covenant with a man like that. God said that I studied Abraham. I know what kind of man he is. And I know he's going to teach his children after me. That's why God made his covenant with Abraham. Now, can you see that the love was unconditional? But the blessing fell on Abraham because he revered God, because he believed God, because God looked into his life and he knew that Abraham would teach his children after God. And Lot didn't do none of that because Lot was not interested. Lot was saved, but he was carnal. So in other words, he got he believed in the God of his fathers, but he didn't want to live for him. That's what it means to be saved and carnal. You know the Lord is salvation. You're born again. You're saved. You believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. In the Old Testament, they look forward to Christ. Now we look back to Christ, but you get everybody gets saved the same way. You have to look at Jesus and you believe. A lot believe that, and he had just enough faith for salvation, and then he didn't want to follow God no further than that. He did not want to live for the Lord, and the Lord knew that, so the Lord made his covenant with Abraham because God's love is unconditional, but many of his blessings have specific conditions, and you got to qualify. You got to be in a position to receive that kind of blessing. So none of those women during Ruth's time, they didn't even know God was in the city looking for a woman of destiny. Do you understand that? God was in the city looking for a woman of destiny. He didn't find anybody. This is why you cannot afford to waste time in your life trying to get in the will of God. Don't let anybody tell you that just because you're young or just because whatever you think you are, educated, finance, whatever it is you think you are, don't let anybody tell you that that means you have time to waste, that you have years to waste, that you don't have to get right with God because of whatever. There is divine destiny being handed out. And there are people in entire cities that don't even know it and go miss out because they weren't living the way the Lord wanted them to live. Now, let me explain to you where God put a woman's power. God put the power of the eagle in its mighty wings. God put the power of the lion in its mighty roar. God put the power of the shark and the alligator in their jaws. God put the power of the ant in his wisdom and the strength of his back. 
God put the power of the scorpion in its mighty tail. With enough uh, scorpions, normally ain't about that big, but there's enough venom in that mighty tail to fell an elephant and definitely a human. Well, God did not put the power of the female in her biceps. God did not put the power of the female in her wallet. God put the power of the woman in her virtue. In her virtue. I know many times women are talking about that's not fair and it calls men and it calls this, but a man's power is not in his virtue. God put our power somewhere else. Women are the female version of his image. And God designed women the way he wanted them designed. And everything that a female has is from the handcrafted design of God. So I'm not trying to be an arrogant, idolatrous blasphemer and tell God that he did it wrong. God designed males the way he wanted us. God designed females the way he wanted us. And God called us his image. In the image of God created he him, mankind. Genesis 127, male and female created he them. Genesis 128. So I'm not trying to be a blasphemer trying to tell God, sorry, trying to tell God that he did it wrong. I'm trying to obey God and obey his word. So a woman's power is in her virtue. And that's why virginity, chastity, and modesty have so much power on women. That's why the New Testament spends so much time talking about virginity, chastity, and modesty. But the Old Testament does too. If you want to look at that in real life, what does virginity, chastity, and modesty mean to a man? Not that men shouldn't be living holy because we should. But if you show up to the table as a man and you say that you're a virgin and you say that you've been chased and you're modest, you've covered up and all that different kind of stuff. You don't wear tight clothes or show off your abs or your biceps or whatever. Does that have the same kind of power as when women do it? See, because God gave women the tools of virginity, chastity, and modesty to clothe themselves as creatures, as women of virtue. That's why it works on women. It doesn't nearly have the same power on a man because our power is not in our virtue. That does not mean we should not be good virtuous men. That does not mean we should live holy, but that is not where God put our power, okay? And so <clears throat> for a woman to maximize impact, always when you use virginity, chastity, and modesty, Always, that always works for females. Not sometimes, all the time, because that's where God put your power. And so when Ruth showed up to town, Ruth did not have virginity. She was married to one of Naomi's sons. So obviously she may love her husband. She did not have virginity, but she did have chastity and she did have modesty. So she brought those two to the table. She was not running around, sleeping with all them young men, and she was not running around uncovered immodest, showing off all of her goods, if you will. And because she lived that way, <clears throat> remember, she's not even a Hebrew. Because she lived that way, that got her on the radar of God Almighty. And that got her on the radar of the richest man in town. And he, Boaz, said to her that the whole town knows that you're worthy. The whole town knows that you're virtuous. The whole town knows that you're excellent. The whole town knows that you're a woman of valor and strength. Doesn't that tell you something? Don't you see now how your reputation walks in the room before you? That's why it matters how you live. Boaz told her clearly, it's because of how you care yourself that I'm willing to do this. If Ruth had been a different kind of person, <clears throat> she wouldn't have got on God's radar and, and she wouldn't have got on Boaz's radar <clears throat> because there was another man in line <clears throat> Sorry, I keep clearing my throat. There's another man in line that was a closer kinsman redeemer than Boaz. And he was the one that had the first legal, legal obligation to redeem Ruth. But Boaz wanted to marry her. <clears throat> I'm sorry. If Boaz had not wanted to marry her, he would have said, okay, well, this brother is actually his job. Because later on in the story, Boaz actually goes to that man and tells him it's his job. But he says, that you got to redeem this land. And the other kinsman says, I will. Then he says, the day you do that, you have to marry Ruth and you have to get all the property. And then the other guy says, well, I can't do it then because I might mess up my own estate and my own inheritance. And then Boaz did it. And Boaz did that because he desired Ruth as his wife. 
Why did he desire Ruth as his wife? And why did God set up a Moabitess woman for that kind of blessing? Because of her virtue, because of her chastity and her modesty. She couldn't bring virginity to the table, but she did bring chastity and modesty because she carried herself like a holy woman, like a woman of excellence, like a woman of noble character. And that's how many of your blessings are gonna come. When you carry yourself with excellence, with nobility, with virtue and strength, but there have been so many blessings when we didn't have our character together, when we weren't living the way the Lord wanted us to live, that we cheated ourselves of because we did not put ourselves in a position to get that blessing because of the way we were living. You understand? So now you should see the importance of virtue. You should see the importance of the decisions that you make. You should see the importance of how you live. You should see the importance of moving into town and everybody watching the way you carry yourself because that's going to make a difference. And it might just not make a little difference. It might be divine destiny. It might be a generational blessing that's going to roll forward for generations to come because God gave you the chance to marry into, marry into a royal bloodline. Mm, mm, mm. I hope you get the impact of what I'm saying. I hope you get the impact because it's not a light thing. And as the Holy Spirit was giving me these revelations, I was like, wow, wow. Because that means there are so many people walking around right now that completely miss their destiny because they weren't living the way I wanted them to live. So I don't want to be in that number. So I want to get my grace from Jesus so I can get in line with what Jesus wants so I can get my divine destiny. Okay. All right. So that's it for this uh, live prophetic word. And so, like I said, at the top of the hour, this is my last live prophetic word for this year. So I'm going to be taking a break. Let me pull my calendar up, but I am going to drop the prophetic locator words. The prophet, prophetic locator word one more time is uh, the two separate words. I give one word on December 31st, the end of the year. And then I give another word on January 1st, the beginning of the year, designed to ask the Lord, where are we? Ask the Lord to give us our grades. Ask the Lord to, uh, like he does in Revelation 2 and 3, tell us what he's trying to say and let us know if we are right or wrong, up or down, on or off, so we can hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So... I'm going to take a break from now until I'm going to be back with the No More Genies. So the No More Genies is going to be on January 14th. So I'm going to take a break from now until January 14th. Okay, so uh, several weeks now to January 14th, but I am going to come back on January 14th with the No More Genies. And then I'll start my weekly live prophetic word that Sunday. Okay, that's the 17th. So I'll be back January 14th with No More Genie, 7 o'clock Thursday night. Then I'll be back Sunday, 2.30 p.m. for the next weekly live prophetic word. So in the meantime, between now and then, what I want you to do, the prophetic uh, located word for this year will drop on December 31st. And the prophetic locator word for 2021 will drop on January 1st. So I go before the Lord and ask him what he wants that word to be. And then I make a video according to what he tells me. So you can check my YouTube channel on December 31st. And you can find the prophetic locator word for 2020. What the Lord has to say about this year. And then yes, I feel some stuff stirring as I'm talking about it. And then on January 1st, go back to my YouTube channel again, and you can hear what the Spirit is saying to us to begin the new year of 2021. So that's December 31st of this year and January 1st of next year. And then it'll be two more weeks after that. On the 14th, I'll be back with no more genies. And then I'll be back that Sunday the 17th with my next weekly live prophetic word. Okay? All right. So thank you to everybody that supported me this year. Oh, let me put that in there. You know, I don't do what I do for money, but if you want to bless my uh, ministry, 
Uh, I asked if you do it through Zelle. Uh, the reason I switched to Zelle because I used to use Cash App, but the reason that I switched to Zelle is because Zelle doesn't charge like any fees. So that is uh, a wonderful blessing. And Zelle is also much easier to access because a lot of most bank accounts have uh, Zelle capabilities actually built in. So put my Zelle on there. <coughs> so if you want to bless me, financially can't excuse me. I'm sorry, cough from my throat is ready to get some water. So yeah, so you know what? I'm going to put that on the screen. So I'm going to put prophetic hater word coming December 31st. 2020, okay, and then prophetic locator or coming January 1st, 2021, okay? All right, so that's it for this year. Thank you so much to those of you that supported me all year long. Thank you so much to those of you that watched me live. Please remember to like and share this video. And please remember that when a prophetic word goes forth from the Lord, we want as many people as possible to hear it. So definitely share it in as many places as you can. Okay. All right. God bless. Uh, if you came on late, go back and watch the video from the top because I had a lot to say. And again, so prophetic locator word, December 31st, 2020. Prophetic locator word, January 1st, 2020, 2021. And then I'm going to say I'm back live. With no more genies uh, on January. Uh, Lisa said, Thank you. You're welcome. On January 14th, 2021, uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay. So I'm putting all that in the chat. So if anybody wants, you know, if anybody's watching this video later, they can uh, <coughs> see all this in the chat. Okay, so I'm back live. No more genies on January 14th, uh, uh, 2021. That's Thursday. So that's the next time you'll see me live. And the located words will be uploaded on my YouTube channel. They're not live videos. I'm not streaming those. I will create them and then upload them live. Okay. All right. God bless. Have a good rest of your year. Remember to get your grace from the Lord. Do not let this year end. And you have not spent some time before the Lord asking him how you did this year, if you're in the will of God or not. If you're doing what the Lord wants you to do, because if you're not doing what the Lord wants you to do as a Christian, you are completely wasting your life. And there is no need to waste your life. It is not wise to waste your life, but rather spend, your, spend some time now during the end of this year with the Lord to be sure that you're doing what he wants you to do. Check in for my prophetic located words, and then I will see you back again live on January 14th, then the following Sunday for our next weekly Sunday live prophetic word. Okay? Amen, and God bless. Have a great rest of your day, and remember that virtue opens doors that nothing else can open. Amen, and God bless. <laughs>